Let us now move ahead with the education session this morning, which is entitled Claiming Your Toastmaster Voice. This session teaches participants how to take full advantage of their Toastmaster speeches by choosing topics that are personally meaningful and that allow the member to speak from the heart and not the head. Mary Nurburn is a lover of words. She began her professional career as a high school English and French teacher. Mary was asked to teach business writing at the college level where she contributed to a business writing college textbooks. She went on to consult as a corporate trainer across Northern Illinois, working with organizations such as Ernst & Young, Price Waterhouse, and AT&T. As a business owner, Mary was selected in 2007 by Dr. Ellie Drake to become one of the 100 founding members of Braveheart Women Global Community, an organization dedicated to personal growth and development. The organization has now over 250,000 members in 80 countries. That's our Mary. Today, Mary is president of Unity Toastmasters in Rogers Park in Chicago. She has placed in international speech contests in both South and North divisions. Her passion is to share opportunities for self-discovery, personal growth, and leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend, Mary Nurburn. Good morning and welcome. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. I have a projecting voice. Welcome. Make them laugh, make them cry, and give them a powerful message to walk away with. Those are the exact words that one of my dear mentors in Toastmasters told me about when I asked him what makes a great speech. How do we write a great speech? One that speaks from the heart, that, that connects energetically with our audience, and frankly, can leave them speechless. What I'm going to share with you today are some techniques of how I learned in my journey in Toastmasters to move from speaking from the head and having it come out of the heart. And there's passion when it comes out of your heart. You become animated and you rock. The word animate, I love words, comes from the Latin, and the root is anima, and anima means soul and sisters and brothers. You rock when you speak from your heart, when you have passion in your heart. What happens, you go into a zone, I feel like I'm in that zone already, and you bring your audience into your zone with you, and so they don't zone out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I have three suggested ways to get into that zone. One is learn to connect to your inner spirit, the inner you, that deep, still voice inside of you. Secondly, confer with your spirit in a special place that you have. And third, learn to access your creative right brain. I'm a former high school teacher, as Mags mentioned, so I have what I call a little bit of the squirrel factor. You know, you're kind of squirrely when you hang around high school kids a lot. So I like to have fun. So if you take a minute and just kind of relax a little bit, and uh, if you want to take notes, that's fine. Or if you want to absorb the information, just take your hands and put them out on your lap and just relax and soak this in. I've gone on a wonderful journey. I'm going to share some of that with you this morning. We are waiting for a connector to my beautiful iMac computer, my new Apple I just got. So it'll be here in a few minutes. So when it gets here, we'll hook it up. In the meantime, I'm going to talk. So the topic today is claiming your Toastmaster's voice, moving your speeches from your head to your heart so you connect with your audience. That's what we're talking about today. Just so I know who's in the audience, how many of you have given, let's say, you're kind of new in Toastmasters, maybe zero to nine speeches. Would you raise your hand, please? Okay, so we got a lot of new folks. Anybody 10 speeches to 25? Very good, so we got some CCs and beyond. How many, anybody 25 or more, speak more than 25? There you go, all right, so you've got that 
down pat, I'm assuming. <laughs> I'll show you later, but I have a picture of my grandson Noah up here, and he's kind of just kind of looking like. And when you open your manual to do another speech, do you ever feel that it's kind of like a homework assignment? Like, what am I going to write about now? And it goes in your head, and it <coughs> clanks around in your head, and kind of makes you a little crazy. And you and you get up there, and remember the. And, sophomore year in high school and speech class and you get up there and say, how to change a flat tire or how to make a great, I don't cook, so a great <laughs> pie crust. Yeah, I don't cook, so that's way out of my zone. <laughs> it's coming from your head, it's those facts. And there's a great expression that says, facts tell, stories sell. So when you start giving your speeches, it's those stories that are coming from your heart. Like, facts are pile up in our head. But when you want to rock and give a speech where you get in the zone and connect to the audience, you are coming from your heart. One of our newer members in our club, Sandeep, has given three speeches. And he started out with his first speech as icebreaker. It was very fine. And he gave another speech. And but his third speech, and I don't know if somebody from Unity remembers the name of the band he talked about. I'm, I went zoned right into the Beatles when he started talking. Remember what Sandeep talked about anyway? Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for remembering. Yeah. He talked about his passion for Led Zeppelin. He said, he's a student at Northwestern, but he said, I wasn't a good student in grade school, in high school, but I learned everything in my life from Led Zeppelin. And he just, <laughs> seriously, he went into a zone, and the passion was extraordinary. And then I got excited about when I saw the Beatles, and I just connected with him. It was, do you know what I'm talking about with energy? I have learned over the years that everything is energy. It's all about energy. And when you connect from your heart, you've got energy in your speeches. I have a wonderful picture up here of a bird in a gilded cage. And sometimes we get stuck in our head with our speeches, and we're kind of trapped in that cage. And, and we're saying, I got this stuff banging around in my head. And, and if I can use an example of Mags, our facilitator, who just achieved her CC last Saturday, 10 speeches. Right. Today. I've with several of the folks in my club to assist them with their speeches. And she had a speech that she was working on in her head. And she was battling. And should I put this in there? And should I put that in there? And she was saying, and she was fighting in her, in her left brain. And she was, I call it the rattling and the round in her head. And then, and then she gave her speech, and I wasn't there because my son got married that day, so I actually never saw the speech. But when she gave her 10th speech last Saturday, she talked about a journey she went on. When she first started in Toastmasters, and she used images about when she runs along the lake and she sees boats out there chained to the harbor, and she felt chained because she was afraid to speak in front of people. And I told her, she, she told a story about how her mother she passed away that she was asked because of her Toastmasters experience to give the eulogy. So she went from afraid to speak in front of people to giving a eulogy at her mother's funeral for a thousand people from her experience in Toastmasters. And I literally sobbed through her whole speech. And it was a little bit because I was so happy for her, but I was saying, Megs, this is exactly what I'm talking about. You went from your head where it rattled around and made you crazy heart and it came out and she connected energetically with her audience and I just sobbed the whole time. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm going to share a little bit with our experience. I have a great quote and it says, and this, when, when we talk about Toastmaster speeches, we're not just talking about, well, I'm on speech number eight or I'm on an advanced speech out of this. And that's not what we're talking about. I truly believe, and this has happened for me, that Toastmasters, a lot of people, how many got in Toastmasters because you got a fear of public speaking, you want to get better? Okay, a lot of people do that. But I'm here to tell you that that's only a part of it. Toastmasters is about personal growth, development, and transformation disguised as getting over your fear of public speaking. <laughs> Seriously, trust me. And this has happened for me. I'm a background in corporate training, so I was okay in front of people. But my handful of years in Toastmasters has taken me to a new level. And wherever you are, when you enter this wonderful organization, you will skyrocket if you follow the plan. 
There's a wonderful business philosopher by the name of Jim Rohn. It's R-O-H-N. And he, anybody know about him? I see some heads nodding. Jim Rohn has been an advisor and a mentor for some of the greats, Tony Robbins, Les Brown, all these people look up to Jim Rohn. And Jim Rohn, one of the things, millions of things he said, he says, the greatest, strongest pull in your life is the pull on the future. And what has happened for me is that Toastmasters, because I've become so involved in my speeches, and I've learned to go from my head and let it come from my heart, is that I have evolved as a person, and I'm going to share part of that journey with you. So what I like to say is, when you move in this whole spirit of personal transformation through your speeches, you kind of step out of that gilded cage, it's a little scary, and you, and you step out, and there you are, and you're this real pretty fine bird, and you peck your feathers, and you start to say, when you get into your speeches and let them give direction to your life, believe it or not, you can pet your feathers and say, wow, I'm pretty good. You, know, you, you really will. You will just get on this journey and improve yourself. You will be amazed what can happen to you with this. So you get out. So would you just take a minute and turn to somebody on either side of you and say, you have something awesome to share. <laughs> with clustering or mind mapping. Do you ever hear that? You know what I'm talking about with that paper on the floor, under the outside of the chairs? So we'll be doing that in a little while, so make sure you have a pen with you because we'll be working on that. Also, getting your speeches to resonate. Resonate means to re-sound. You resonate with yourself, with your audience. You, you identify your core values through your speech. This has happened to me. This is my story. You start to identify your core speech and you say, this is important to me. I will not compromise on that. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You kind of learn that through your speeches. I'm seeing some heads nod with that. Also, you're speaking about yourself. And as my sister Mickey always says, honor your journey. It's so important. Wherever you are in your life, your journey, each single person here, you, we all have a separate journey that we're on. And you honor that journey. So important, and you do that through your speech. Very, very powerful. So here's a little bit of my story. I started out as this mild mannered. I, I've been a, been a teacher and trainer most of my life, but new to Toastmasters. So I, I gave my first icebreaker speech, and I started out in Oak Lawn Toastmasters, where I grew up, and so it was exciting. And I grew up in Oak Lawn, and I was telling all these facts from my head, and that's where I was. And somehow. I was able to change and move to my heart. And I had given some speeches. In fact, my friend Jackie in the back of the room, if you don't mind if I pick on my dear, dear friend Jackie, I gave a speech in January, and she had never seen me speak, and I heard her say, oh, wow, because she saw me get into the zone, and it's powerful. How many of you have seen people get into the zone when they give a speech? Wow, that's good. And, and we can all do, we all have that, that gift to do that. So I moved from this person to step into where I have been energetically, and I was able to move on with my speech. And in fact, my speech number six, as we all know, if you've been looking at your manual, is, is the one about vocal variety. And so my speech was, claim your voice, claim your power. And so what I decided to do for that, I was researching sound and energy and music and healing, and I thought, well, I've been in about, I've, I, I thought about that, so I gave my speech, and then in January, I actually gave this speech where I had said to myself, oh, I've been in about 10 choirs, and I, I, I can sing well, and I've taken singing lessons, and I thought, I think it's about time for me to sing during my speech. So I had, had been asked by a friend of mine who has a cabaret choir chorus, and she said, come and inspire my group. So I wrote a speech called Embrace Your Song. And I was giving my speech, and all of a sudden I had memorized this, and I listened to Ella Fitzgerald on YouTube about 50 times. And I sang part of Embraceable You, and I just broke into song somehow. And I sang, and I was, ooh, this is cool. So you just, you just push yourself. I'm like, and I was always, how many like to sing in front of people? 
<laughs> right? So speaking in front of people is challenging for a lot of us as well. But to sing is like, so oh, that was a push. That was a real, real push for me. So what's bubbling up inside of you? What's bubbling up? I have a picture of a pot boiling up where I was over there on the outside before over by the restaurant looking at some people in the hot tub. We've got stuff bubbling up inside of us. My journey for the past 15 years has been on personal growth and development. I have seen every speaker from Les Brown to Brian Tracy to everybody. I've met them, I've got their CD, I got everything. I'm just, I don't want to say personal development junkie, but I, I love, I love the stuff. I love it. And I internalize a lot of it. So what I'm saying to you is inside, whatever you've been internalizing in your life, it starts bubbling up. So if you let yourself, you can let that come out in your speeches. Not from your head, but it's coming out from your heart. Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? Okay. All right. You can actually set a framework for yourself and, and sit at the drawing board of your life and actually say, I'm going to make some changes in my life. So what I did, I spoke from my heart. I had a speech called Track Your True Calling. I had a speech called Design Your Life. I go, where's this stuff coming from? But it was from all this good personal development information I was getting. And you can do the same thing. It will bubble up inside of you. And my speeches have given direction to my life. Does that make sense? <coughs> I've done it, you can do the same thing too, so it's very, very powerful. All right, how many of you, the three things I was talking about, connect to that quiet, still place inside of you. Take some time, you have to schedule it, and how many of you use some kind of planner, or smartphone or something to schedule your time? Don't we all? We're, we're just scheduled people. And how many of you schedule time for yourself, to be just by yourself in quiet? Does anybody ever do that? Actual quiet, you don't have a radio, you don't have a TV, absolute quiet. My mother lived with me the last seven years of her life, and she would sit with me sometimes and sit at the table in perfect quiet, and you'd be working on her crop, and she goes, Mother, I have a great time. I can be by myself all day and have a great time. But it's taking that time, and I would highly recommend that you schedule. You know how they say schedule a date with your whatever, whoever your favorite friend is to go on a date with? Schedule some time for you. Schedule some time for you to be in conference with your spirit. Confer means, the F-E-R root means to bring or to carry. Bring together to yourself and say, all right, this is who I am. And then third step, I'm going to teach you how to do a simple activity, and it's called clustering. And what clustering does is allows us to access the creative side of our brain. How many of you have heard the expression, left brain, right brain. Right. Okay. How many of you know which side of the brain is the side with the organized, the logical, does anybody know? Left. 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 left, all right, so in case you've never heard of this, the, I'm not Dr. Oz here with the plastic gloves and the cushy brain out front, I'm talking conceptually. We talk about the left brain, we talk about the right brain. So I'm going left, I'm going right because I'm talking about the brain. The left brain is the side that tends to be organized, logical, likes Excel spreadsheets. I had a fellow I worked for once who said, here, let's put that in an Excel spreadsheet. And I just kept doing that all the time because it's logical, organized. But that left, and I'm going to do left brain, I'm going to do this a lot. Left brain is the critic and the sensor, and the one that will say, oh, that was a ridiculous idea for a speech. Who would ever want to hear about that? That's a dumb idea. That's our left brain, right? Did you ever have that when you're thinking of a speech? Mm -hmm. Oh, whatever. That's the left brain talking to us. Got it? The right, here's the right brain, okay. The right brain, on the other hand, is the creative side. It's the side that sees symbols and pictures and images and sees patterns after a while. It's kind of like a bunch of grapes. The left brain is the rows and the columns, and the right brain is like a big bunch of grapes. Do you know who people who are very do you know people who are very left brain, very organized? Like my sister, if you want to find somebody who's left brain, peek in their clothes closet. My sister is very left brain. I went to see a new outfit she got once. 
she had her clothes lined up, all the slacks, all the shirts, and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but they were lined up according to color. So she had the, seriously, she had the dark, the, the black, the dark gray, the dark brown, the navy, and the colors got lighter, and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> that's, that's someone's left brain. How many of those people like that, or are you like that? Right. Right. The right brain, on the other hand, is kind of like, the monkey all over the place and not, not, not organized and you open their drawers, check their, I don't want to say underwear, whoa, it's scary, isn't it? So that's kind of, so that's a good way to check if you're not sure. Go and open your own drawers and see what you see. It'll tell you a little bit about yourself. So what we're going to talk about is a strategy called clustering. Who's ever heard of clustering or mind mapping? A few people. I'm going to walk you through that. In just a minute. And so you're going to be getting your pens out a little bit. And remember, this is all for fun. But it's a good technique. All right. Albert Einstein has a wonderful quote, and I really like him a lot. We all know Albert Einstein. And he said, <coughs> Imagination is everything. He says, It is the preview of life's coming attraction. Imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attraction. Albert Einstein also says that imagination is more powerful than knowledge. What's packed in that left brain? Knowledge. And we want to get up there and give a speech and spew knowledge on people. But what Einstein would do, and they did an autopsy on his brain after he died, and they found that that creative side of his brain was physically 15% larger than the other side. So that's probably a secret. But what he would do is he would, I read this about him, he would consciously put his left brain on hold and he would access the right side of the brain. So that's what we're going to do today. Is everybody with me? Are you ready to have some fun? I'd like fun. <laughs> so we're going to do a little experiment with that and actually work on some clustering. Okay, so Albert Einstein would say, okay, left brain critic who said this is not possible, you're going to sit on hold. I'm going to put you in a timeout. Anybody have children in here? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what a timeout is? Okay, left brain, you can sit on that little chair over there. And you can make up, keep it busy, you can do an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> of all the clubs you can visit for the club ambassador program so you can get your beautiful pin by June 30th. And left brain will just be delight to sit over there. But you've got to keep it over there. Because when you are attempting to access your right brain, where all that creative stuff is, that left brain is going to be right on you. You've got to say, take a time out. Am I making sense? Yes. So you can actually, that's what Einstein did. He would segregate that. He would say, left brain sit on hold because I am going to access my right brain. And while I'm at it, I might come up with a theory of relativity, which I have <laughs> no idea what it means, but it's good stuff. So I'm not, a, I'm not a science head, if you will. Okay. One of the other important steps when you are getting ready, and we're going to do this in a bit, to access the right side of your brain is to release the inner child within you. This is very, very important. We come in, and one of my mentors, Jeffrey Combs, used to have all the gentlemen in the audience say, okay, men, take those pens out of your pocket. You know, and some guys used to have those plastic things in their pockets so they wouldn't get them. Take it out, okay, everybody move the chairs around and relax. That's how you have to be. And releasing that child within, if you walk and look at a little bitty child, how, do they, how does that child look at the world? What happens to us sometimes is that we lose that sense of creativity that we have, that we had as a child. Think of what you loved as a child. Take a minute and think. What did you love to do as a child? I like to, <laughs> I like to roller skate. I like to ice skate. But I was very quiet when I was in grade school. In fact, they called me giggles because I hardly talked. But you know what I would do as a child? And this child stuff never leaves you. It's, it's deep, deep, buried, it's in there. And I would sit in my room and I had this big dresser and this great big mirror. And my family would be out there reading, watching TV. I'd have the door shut. And I'd be talking in the mirror. I'd have my hair all fixed up and I'd be, you know, talk amongst yourself. And I'd have this conversation with Mary in the mirror 
But then when I go out in the real world, I was giggles because I was so shy. And that speaking, that never went away. It never went away. And when I got in high school and I fell in love with language and I said, I'm going to be in high, a high school English teacher. And I student talk and I told the story of, I was working on the story of the miracle worker, the, you know the story of Helen Keller and her word that she remembered and she said, remember when she said oh, that with the pump to go wah, wah. And I had this kid growing in the back of the room and he was going wah, wah. And of course, what happened to giggles? I went into a hysterical giggling fit and I had this room of sophomores roaring at me. <laughs> because I, I just couldn't stop giggling. But I knew that I wanted to be an English teacher and I fought through and I did. And that's what is so important that you continue to fight on with what's important to you. So think, think what is a child. And don't be afraid to go and access that good stuff that's in your right brain. Everybody with me? You good? Okay. We are ready to continue. And remember to always keep that right brain part of you going. I have a great photo of my husband standing with the Easter Bunny. And, and Jerry, who is a wonderful philosopher, says, keep your mind active and keep your heart hopeful. And that's what it is. Kind of like Jim Rohn. He's right up there with Jim Rohn. The greatest pull of your life is the pull on the future. And let's let our speeches go there. We're going to talk about clustering now. Is everybody following okay? Yes. All right. Clustering is an activity of the, which side of the brain? Yes. Very good. Okay, where is left brain right now? Yes. All right, time out. Left brain is in a time out. Very good. All right, good, good students here. Okay. When you are clustering, clustering is a self-organizing activity. It, you don't need an Excel spreadsheet. It will just happen in your brain. Okay. You will have lightning fast associations. So when you get your pen going, you can keep it moving as fast as you can. You can because that right brain is moving very, very quickly. It's got all these wonderful ideas, all this stuff that's bubbling up inside of you is waiting to come out. And I say, through your speeches, if you allow it to come out of your heart, it's ready to come out and bubble up. So you've got to work fast when you're clustering. It's not time to say, well, is this a good idea, or is that a, no, 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 no. All your ideas are equal, they're all valid, they're all good. You'll decide which ones are important for you or not. Okay, so we're going to be doing some clustering. So you're going to write as fast as you can. Have you ever gone down the highway and somebody goes past you on a crotch rocket and you go like, boom, and you watch them go by? That's how fast you'll be writing. Because your right brain is just packed with images and pictures and stuff that wants to get down on the paper so you can take it and then you'll call that brain back and say, okay, editor, and I love working with words. I love sitting down on a computer and manipulating words and getting everything perfect. I love that. But that's the left brain. We're talking about the right brain. And left brain is where? <coughs> and a chair out of timeout. Okay. Does everybody kind of get the, the gist of clustering? Okay. What I'm going to do is show you an example. I just happened to have good old teacher. Okay, let's put this up close. All right? So you're going to come up with some ideas. And we're going to cluster the color green. And this is what I used to do. I was actually asked by an accounting firm who said, we've got so many left brain people here. They're wonderful for numbers, but they're not creative all. So I, I did research and I came up with this program. We're going to color the cluster green. Okay? We're going to do a little practice. What comes into your head? I'm going to like shout out some answers. What? Give me a word with green. What comes to your mind? Go. Green. Grass. Okay, grass. Okay, grass. Now then I go trees, which is an offshoot of that, right? Okay. Oh, peaceful. Okay. All right. Peaceful. Okay, and then off of that, we can do a little serene. You see what I'm doing? See how fast I'm going? Somebody said money. What do you think of when you think of money? Where are you going? What? Okay. <laughs> Happiness. Okay. I can do shopping off of that. What else? Keep going. Spending, okay, that's an offshoot of shopping, right? Spending, what else? Okay, somebody said, I'm running out of color here. It's okay. Conservation, okay, conservation. 
This is supposed to be grain conservation. Hybrid. Okay. Oh, hybrid. Ooh, where am I going with that? What else? Yeah. The outdoors. Outdoors. Okay, conservation. I don't know where it's come from. What else? Green. 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 Um, sweet and sour lollipops. Okay, lollipops. Okay. Apple. Oh, green apple. Oh, green apple. Oh, okay. Green apples. Green apples. Nature. Nature. Oh, my gosh. It's good. You see what I'm doing? It's whatever pops in your head. And if one idea leads to another, if you think green is peaceful and you want to go there, then serene and it's going to take you someplace. And some ideas are going to be a dead end. Maybe you're thinking of green and vegetables and you go broccoli and um, Brussels sprouts, eh, yeah, I'm not going to go there. And then you, you go in a different direction. And, you will, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. So let's get the paper passed out. There, on the inside and the outside, there are pieces of paper. Would you each take a color that you enjoy? Grab a piece and pass one down. Go. My childhood ambitious, my biggest obstacle, my wildest dream, the highlight of my life. 
got those. Does anybody have any questions or reflections or ahas or yes? You know, when you say it connects with something that has a child, you suggest putting something on top of that crayon. Uh huh. Yes. Crayons. So putting those items. Yes. Yes. If, if you want, it's a great question. Getting something connecting with your childhood. Getting some crayons and drawing. I mean, have some fun with this. Whatever. If you have to sit on the floor and cluster, and let that, that all that child, all that stuff that's bubbling up that that we as adults we suppress and we put it off on the side. That, that doesn't make any sense. Go back and connect with who you are. You know how it works, and they they say in a meeting or on a call or in a conference. Be on a conference with yourself and put yourself in conference and give your time to connect with your spirit and let it come out in your speeches. It will change your life. Questions? Reflections? Comments? Yes. I have a, 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 a whiteboard in my kitchen. Yes. My bucket list. Okay. Yes. I've gotten to other stuff. I'm going to map each one of those comments. And which ones really resonate with me after I've done this? And yes. Yes. And Jerry has... Postcards, and maybe Jackie, you can help hand, jump up and help out if you jump up now and help Jerry hand out some. And, and who else? <coughs> and who else is? Well, I was going to thank you for giving us that oh, insight and helping me connect and let the right way from scheduling. I mean, I really used to the scheduling for my work. It takes up a big chunk that until you have to place it on the calendar. And, it ain't going to happen. So he said, until you place that conference time with yourself, on a schedule, because we're very scheduled people, and a lot of us live chaotic lives, you have to schedule that time in for yourself to go to your special place. And so on that card, there will be some a bubble chart, and you can pick those, my hero, or whatever you want to talk about, and sit down and connect with who you are in your past, and this is my childhood. Any other comments, questions, or reflections? Yes? I want to, um, I've got a speech I've, it's stuck. I've got all these facts, and so now I know why I can uh, go on to it, because I'm enthusiastic about hybrids and and electrical vehicles and okay. I don't know why I can finish my speech right okay. now. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great example. So you're gonna put hybrid in the middle of that circle, go to your special place and you just let it at it. Right. And then you're gonna to start to write. As soon right. as something pops in your head then you go and then you just write, 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 write. The key is miles per gallon. Huh? Miles per gallon. Miles per gallon. And this can go fast you got a hybrid. Any other comments? Yes sir. Well my comment is that this process is very interesting. Because what it does is it takes you out of this linear flow of, oh, I start here, here's the middle, here's the end. And it waits till later to address that. It says, let's get the ideas out. Let's see what these ideas that I really want to tackle are. Like, if that was the end result with the green thing up there, you might say, oh, I'm not that interested in the grass. But maybe the conservation thing was, was it for me. Exactly. Exactly. And then you, maybe you pick up another aspect, and then you build from that. Excellent student. I think everybody heard him. It was a loud voice. So that's exactly it. That's it in a nutshell. That's a recap. One other comment. Cool. One of the things that I wanted to say to the people on the opposite end of the yeah. curve that my thought was my most ridiculous thing. Yeah. The first time I heard this was at a <coughs> meeting maybe 11 years okay. ago, and I thought this is a really ridiculous thing. Yeah. And generally speaking, that is part of the way that I think anyway, mm -hmm. but eventually let it grow on you and go back and try it again every once in a while if you're on the ridiculous internet and it will still, you'll learn value from it if you if you revisit it every once in a while. Okay. It took me about 11 years to be able to sit down. And yeah, do yeah, that. yeah, hopefully it won't take 11 years, but she started out, <laughs> she started out thinking it was ridiculous, but this is a learned skill and it just takes practice, practice, you gotta deal with yourself. In quiet, no TV blaring, no kids, by yourself. It's scary for some people to be by ourselves, right? Thank you. But it's good. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. we, I, I know there are probably more questions and comments, but we do need to get out of here and let somebody else come in. I can practically taste the enthusiasm in the air and their ideas flying around the place. And thank you so much, Mary.